Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Adrian First and Fifteen. Our international ground rounds guest today is Professor Diliana Viceva. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you. So I've uh, I had the pleasure to invite uh, Diliana for this talk regarding pediatric rhinosinusitis. Uh, for those who don't know, she is uh, the president of the Bulgarian Rhinologic Society and a member, uh, rhinology member of the Medical University of Plovdiv. So uh, the task today is pediatric rhinosinusitis and evidence uh, new evidence regarding the new EPOS guidelines 2020. So before she will enter in the detail regarding her task, I would like to stress once again for the, all the attendees that are participating through the Zoom application, through Facebook, YouTube, face, uh, Twitch, and LinkedIn, all the questions should be asked at the end of her talk. However, you can type your question uh, on the chat board of the social media channel, okay? So please, Diliana, would you please share your presentation? Hello, everybody. Thank you, Puya, for your kind invitation. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Sinonaso uh, Association. And um, today, I want to speak for pediatric rhinosinusitis and what is uh, new about treatment, management, because you know that the management in pediatric population is very, very difficult. Now, the first of all, we have to start to speak for development of sinuses. Why it's very important to know the development of the sinuses. Unfortunately, it's not starting. What about development? We start with maxillary sinus. If you are doing x-ray and remind yourself that x-ray of the pediatric sinuses is non-informative, but some of ENT doctors, they're doing. That's why if we are doing, we see some plant films at four to five months, maxillary sinus. What about ethmoid sinus? Ethmoid scenes on radiographs at one year. Sphenoid sinus, pneumatization begins at age three. And frontal sinus is very important to know since on the radiographs at age five to six. Why? Because sometimes we have headache in children and uh, some children, they have hypoplasia of the frontal sinus. Functions of the sinuses, they're very, very important. And when, it when we are treating in childhood, the rhinosinusitis and pediatric rhinosinusitis, all the time we have to remind in, in, in our uh, brain that we have to keep the normal functions of the sinuses because they decrease skull weight, impact resonance to voice and humidified and warming heart rate and et cetera, et cetera. And that's why for us is very, very important to keep the normal functions of these sinuses. But of course, it's very difficult because, you know, the, the people, they have some structural abnormalities like uh, deviated septum, uh, larger na nasi air cells, hyperplastic sinuses and coronal abnormalities. That's why we have main question which are predisposing factors for the nasal obstruction. The nasal obstruction is the main cause for the pediatric rhinosinusitis. And we have three groups for this nasal obstruction. Mucosal swelling, like systemic disorder, viral upper respiratory infections, allergic rhinitis, cystic fibrosis, and some local insult like a swimming, diving, and my favorite rhinitis medicamentosa. You know that some of ENT doctors, they prescribe so many nasal drops in, in child noses, but what we are doing, we are doing blockage of the nasal mucosa and mucociliary clearance, and we blocked the nasal um, patency. Uh, that's why the next group is, uh, we have to think for the mechanical obstruction like adenoids, horn hour, treasure, deviated septum, and in some other foreign body in children we can find, uh, and some mucus abnormalities. About nasal obstruction, it's very important to think for what? For growth mechanisms. The first is coming from genes and from genetics. 
Uh, why? Because we have mechanical stresses, dental eruptions, and et cetera, et cetera. These factors are very important, finally, to, to look at the uh, nose anatomy. And soft tissue changes also in childhood, and we have to find the balance between structure and functional balance between muscles, uh, bones, and um, osteogenic membranes and cartilages. That's why if you are thinking for nasal obstruction, you have to think also for the soft tissue, but don't forget nasal maxillary complex septum because uh, it's, they play a role for functional biomechanical stresses. And um, when we have deviated nasal septum here, you can see very nice figure and uh, what is happened uh, during the different ages and normal septal deformities are seen at birth in over 6% of babies. And what is the role of, of the nasal terminates? Uh, nasal terminates, they built up airway resistance and air conditioning, but we have to keep these nasal terminates because they're very important for nasal patency. And here you can see very nice picture was published 1905 from Kalios in one newborn. And when exam the child, don't think only for the nasal obstruction. And why it's coming nasal obstruction? In some children, we can uh, have difficulties during the nasal breathing. And I'm telling my students that uh, they have lazy noses. Lazy noses, they, they're never uh, breathing with noses. That's why we have to do um, examination of the oral cavity. Also, we have to, uh, to look at the tongue and also in the teeth. When does nasal obstruction play a role? EPOS 2020 uh, telling us that we have some cardinal symptoms of chronic rhinosinusitis, which are very important uh, like causes for, for this chronic rhinosinusitis. Of course, the first is nasal obstruction, changes in sense of smell, nasal discharge, and facial pain. If you ask children, they, they are telling you, like a doctor, that they have headache. History is very important. You have to ask more and more parents, but sometimes you have to listen what uh, children telling you. Because parents, they, some, they have some psychological, emotional problems during the day. That's why if you're asking children, they, they, they're clear and they can tell you where is the headache and what they're feeling. That's why ask, 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 and it will be very helpful if you are doing um, right diagnosis in each one case. Physical examination include rhinoscopy with nasal speculum or anterior rhinoscopy. Also, we're using pediatric nasal endoscopes and uh, sometimes flexible rhinoscopy. But uh, if we have older children, it's better to do examine uh, the, um, better to do examine nose before and after the the congestion, and we have to do also allergic testing. Um, the main question is physiology. And don't forget these anatomical structures, which are very important for the nasal breathing, also for the future pediatric rhinosinusitis. This is the first anatomical structure nasal valve. It's very important uh, option for the rhinoplastic surgeons, nasal cycle. And we have to keep the mucociliary clearance and ciliary action. So, and if we examine the teenagers, don't forget that they have formos and sometimes what they're doing, they're doing non-allergic rhinitis. If you want to measure the objective nasal breathing or nasal patency, we use three methods for them. The first of all, uh, we're using acoustic rhinometry, which is shown us the nasal patency, also nasal geometry. And uh, we can uh, use this method from newborn age. And uh, after eight years old, we can use rhinomanometry and we are looking with rhinomanometry function of this nasal breathing. And also we can use in children, uh, peak nasal inspiratory floor. And now the main question, what is this pediatric rhinosinusitis? 
if we have or we don't have it, what we have to do, how we have to do, and why we have to do. Of course, we start with etiology. Etiology of pediatric coronosomocytis, you know, it's, uh, it's coming from streptococcus pneumonia, hemophilus influenza, moraxala cateralis, and our favorite, Staphylococcus aureus. But we are living in difficult period of uh, uh, we of a uh, pandemic era, I can say, and also we have uh, mm, we have antibiotic resistance, and the new terminology for this antibiotic resistance it's sinus microbiome. The last years, I can say four or five years, uh, we have not so many publications for sinus microbiome. But this, uh, this sinus microbiome, it's a key word for treatment of management of, um, of pediatric rhinosinusitis and not only pediatric in adults also. And now on this picture, you can see Bulgarian yogurt. Bulgarian yogurt is one of the best in the world, you're the unique lactobacillus bulgaricus bul bul um, in Bulgaria. This is a slide. Uh, on which I'm showing you. One publication was published uh, 2017 of age. And uh, here you can see what is the result of microbiology in sinus puncture and sinus culture by age. What we are looking from five to nine years old, we have peak of methicillin sensitive Staphylococcus aureus or methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And, but what has happened more than 15 years? our favorite Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, you know, if we have, and if you are not successful in our treatment, could be happened chronic coronacinocytis. It's a serious problem for the nasal mucosa. Now, when we are talking that we have pediatric coronacinocytis following guidelines of the EPOS 2020, this means inflammation of the nose and paranasal sinuses by presence of two or more symptoms, one of which should be nasal obstruction and nasal discharge, plus minus facial pain or headache and cough. Of course, in depends, uh, we have uh, classification, acute, superacute, and chronic. Acute, when we are talking, when we have duration less than 12 weeks, and presence of endoscopic signs like nasal obstruction, discovered nasal discharge or cough. And we have to ask questions or allergic symptoms should be included. What about cough? Many parents are coming with their children in your office and asking you, okay, my, my child has a cough. And uh, in the past, we had, we had one terminology, post-nasal drip syndrome. And now, um, from 10 years, now we change the terminology. We are talking that we have upper uh, airway cough syndrome. From where is coming this cough syndrome? It's coming from rhinitis, from rhinosinusitis. And can you imagine it's coming from reflux diseases and also from asthma and eosinophilic bronchitis. Uh, in these children, we have to think for cough hypersensitivity syndrome in different type of phenotypes. Now, in the new guidelines in EPOS 2020, we are also talking for phenotypes. For acute we have to do differential diagnosis, not immediately to say, okay, this child has a rhinosinusitis. The first, we can find viral infection of the upper airways, our favorite allergic rhinitis, but the serious problems are non-allergic rhinitis because trust me, uh, many ENT doctors, they're never thinking for non-allergic rhinitis in, in their practice, but we have so many more than 15 kinds of non-allergic rhinitis and their treatment is very, very difficult because we have to find the etiological factors and we have to treat them. Some other differential diagnosis, it's a gastroesophageal reflux disease, cystic fibrosis, IgA immune deficiency, and also in children, sometimes we can find odontogenic rhinitis. What about allergic rhinitis? What we are doing? Of course, the gold standard is skin prick test, and uh, it means allergy testing, nasal endoscopy, immunodeficiency testing. In some cases, we are doing CT or MRI. 
at what about non-allergic rhinitis? They're coming from uh, environmental irritants, some infections, hormone changes. And last years, we are talking that we have local allergic rhinitis. Also, we have to manage them very well. And uh, American Academy of Photorhinolaryngology are telling us that one of the causes for the pediatric chronosinusitis is, uh, is a gastroesophageal reflux disease. Uh, but look very carefully on this slide. This is normal ph physiological process. 50% of infants from zero to three months of age, they have this gastroesophageal reflux. And 25 of infants from three to six months of age. And finally, five of infants from 10 to 12 months of age. And 20% of pH probe reflux episodes are visible reflux. And he, here you can see the pathophysiological mechanism for cough generation and how it's coming off. That's why if we have a child who has a cough, you what we have to do, you have to treat the rhinosinusitis or different kind of rhinitis. And also we have to um, ask some questions during the history for gastroesophageal reflux disease. And pediatric rhinosinusitis is chronic. It's a serious, serious problem because we have duration more than 12 weeks, the same clinical symptoms, but a endoscopic signs of nasal polyps. That's why we have to do differential diagnosis with cystic fibrosis. And uh, what we can find also mucoporulent secretion from the middle meatus, edema, and of course, presence of the CT abnormality. Well, uh, what uh, we can find uh, in uh, like a predisposing factors in pediatric chronic, the, the factors, predisposing factors are similar like in nasal obstructions, but here we have immune deficiency and we have to investigate IgG, IgA, also genetics, some tests. And uh, it's nice to see also IgE tests and some other um, factors you know better than me, I think. Now, uh, EPOS 2020. Um, EPOS 2020, uh, how we can manage the pediatric rhinosinusitis. If we follow the EPOS 2020, we have classification of primary chronic rhinosinusitis and secondary. And here you can see the one new table how is looking. If we have primary chronic rhinosinusitis, doesn't matter adults or children, we have uh, localized unilaterally and diffused bilateral. After that, we manage them in depends of endotype dominance, type two or non-type two. And examples of phenotypes, what can be, can be allergic fungal rhinosinusitis, central compartment allergic rhinitis, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyp, eosinophilic chronic rhinosinusitis. What about secondary chronic rhinosinusitis? This is adapted um, this year. I came the same, but if you look endotype dominance, we have local pathology, mechanical inflammatory immunity, which are following the next steps for examples of phenotypes and what will be happen with this kind of patients. Of course, diagnosis we are putting with nasal endoscopy in children, we're using some special endoscopes, pediatric en endoscopes. And again, I'm remind you that we have little role of X-ray. X-ray, if you're using in our practice, it's non-informative and it's not good, good to use for each one sneezing, for example. You have to be very careful because we cannot see anything uh, except maxillary sinus or hyperplasia or frontal sinus. And you cannot see sphenoid sinus, you know better than me. And uh, when we use CT scan in children, we use, this is of course, it's a gold standard. We have to do under the general anesthesia. And, but when we have to start to do, when child is unresponsible to 48 hours of antibiotics. And immediately we have to do, and we have to see what is happening. In some cases, we're using both methods, CT plus MRI, or in some other children, we're using uh, MRI only to see the soft tissues, neoplastic pathology, and et cetera, et cetera. 
it's very nice subject to see what is happening with adenoids and why we are talking and why we have so many publications for biofilm research. And we are still not ready because biofilms we can find here, you can see very nice what is happening if we have uh, detection with hematoxylineosine and what is happening uh, with nasal mucosa, how everything is changing if we have biofilm. And one publication is coming from West Virginia, USA, evidence of biofilm on adenoid and sinus mucosa in pediatric chronic chronosinusitis. You know, the, the main cause for pediatric chronic chronosinusitis are adenoids. And the first, what we have to do, because they have a biofilm adenoids, and uh, the, they provocate secondary rhinosinusitis and the spread of infection. Here I put a very nice uh, slide for timeline of antibiotic resistance. And you can see how is, uh, what has happened with many, many antibiotics and finally no one working because we, we use for everything. And that's why this antibiotic resistance is very serious at that time. And now it's coming one question. Antibiotic cause pediatric chronic chromosomocytes, yes or no? And here, where I, sh I want to show you a very nice um, publication, which is coming from Harvard Medical School. And here you can see this figure when it's shown what is happening with the nasal mucosa. Here we have healthy sinus microbiome, back to the sinus biome. And when we have dysbiosis, it depends of the microorganisms, what is happening, how is damaged this nasal mucosa if we have chronic rhinosinusitis and how is mixed this sinus microbiome. Then, if you're looking at this picture, you have to remind yourself when you treat your patients, doesn't matter, um, children or adults, sinus microbiome now, it's, um, we have to fix the balance between these microorganisms and to be successful. Here you can see so many publications. Again, I remind yourself what is happening with the nasal mucosa. Every year we have so many, many publications about the, the problem for the chronic rhinosinusitis. That's why I am strongly re, um, suggest you to download it EPOS 2020 and to read very carefully and to, to follow the guidelines in your practice. If you want to compare what is the difference between children and adults in chronic rhinosinusitis, of course, in children we have adenoids. Histology, we have mainly neutrophils and endoscopically we have rarely polypoid um, tissue. And uh, if you're looking on, on the CT scan, we have more pansinusitis. Uh, if we have nasal polyps, we have to do clinical differentiation between um, cystic fibrosis and primary ciliary dyskinesia, and also Cartagenaer syndrome, I, I mean. Um, what, where is the problem? The problem is cystic fibrosis is autosomal recessive chromosome 7. And in primary ciliary dyskinesia, we have autosomal recessive chromosome 6 to 7. Now I'm showing you management and uh, you can free download it, Supplement 29 by Journal of Rhinology. And here you can, I'm showing uh, how you can, where you can download it, this supplement and uh, rhinologyjournal.com. Now, uh, if we have care pathway for acute rhinosinusitis, what is new in this EPOS 2020? Now, we are talking that we have self-care pharmacy. Two, acute rhinosinusitis symptoms. For example, nasal obstruction, discovery, discharge. And um, if we have fever um, and unilateral disease and pear and something else, what uh, we have to suggest, decongestions more than 10 days, uh, herbal medicine, vitamin C, and avoid antibiotics. Then if we are not successful, we continue in primary care and uh, check likely anti acute bacterial rhinosinusitis. And if we have symptoms more than 10 days, then, then what, what we suggest to use nasal corticosteroids. But I remind yourself that you know that corticosteroids, they have some side effects. That's why 
we have to be very, very careful in children. Of course, we have to use them in our practice, but not for a long period of time. And also you can use decongestion, saline, sprays and antibiotics. And if we are not successful, we continue the secondary care. Of course, this uh, slide is not clear because I took from this uh, new um, guidelines, but you can find if you are do downloading EPOS 2020. What we suggest um, for children with acute post-viral sinus anxieties is a type of acute sinus anxieties, antibiotics, um, when we have only acute post-viral rhinosinusitis, nasal corticosteroids seems to be effective in redu uh, reducing total symptom score and antihistamines, no one study evaluating antihistamines versus placebo in addition. And if you, if you know, um, following the practice of ENT doctors, uh, many ENT doctors, they prescribe so many, many antihistamines and uh, it's not good to use um, for everything this this antihistamines and also they suggest bacterial aids. but if you have children with acute bacterial rhinosinusitis then we suggest to use antibiotics and mucolytics what about chronic rhinosinusitis which i already told you that it's a serious problem the first antibiotics nasal corticosteroids and uh, look what they're writing. There is no evidence regarding the efficacy of intranasal steroids in the treatment. And uh, they suggest uh, systemic steroids, short course saline irrigation. And the first step, surgical step is adenoidectomy or functional endoscopic sinus surgery. Okay, this is APOS, but I want to compare with uh, clinical consensus statement of pediatric chronic rhinosinusitis of American Academy. It was published 2014. What is the maximum medical management? 20 conservative days of antibiotic management, a better response than 10 day therapy and daily nasal saline irrigations and intranasal steroids use with or without antibiotic. And look again, treatment for gastroesophageal reflux. And what is important, adenoidectomy has been shown to decrease a lot of nasopharyngeal pathogens. And we have strong consensus for children down six years of age. And um, adenoidectomy can have a beneficial therapeutic effect independent of endoscopic sinus surgery. And tonsillectomy without adenoidectomy is not useful in the treatment of pediatric chronic chronosomocytes. Then the main question is, where do we operate the child with rhinosinusitis? Very rarely. And uh, if we need to do surgery, of course, we have to do always sandwich treatment. It means the first maximum medical therapy after that surgery, and we have to do next medical uh, treatment. Why? Because um, the serious problem is, are the chronic rhinosinusitis in children. I'm sure that some, some of you will ask me about balloon dilatation. Of course, we have indications and contraindications for balloon dilatation. Balloon dilatation, I had a panel in uh, Paris uh, during the IFOS meeting for balloon dilatation. And uh, if you ask me, balloon dilatation, they're using mainly in USA, but um, it's very expensive method. And for, I mean, for Europe, that's why uh, the results are the same if you ask me which method is better, functional endoscopic sinus surgery or balloon, both of them they have, um, we can use in our practice. But um, why we, we are talking that we have functional endoscopic sinus surgery? Of course, this kind of surgery in children is very difficult. And uh, um, it, because you know, the sinuses are smaller and um, that's why, um, but the name is coming, we are keeping the functions. All the time I'm reminding you that we have to keep the functions of the sinuses. Then the main question is management. What is the, the management? The management is very difficult and it's individual in each one case. Uh, here you can see not, not so good of seeing uh, this another one. 
um, picture or table how we have to treat the chronic ransom ascites in children. And, uh, but shortly, I can remind you the first, what we have to do. If the child has adenoid hypertrophy, we have to do adenoidectomy. If after that is not successful, this uh, rhinosomocytis, we have to continue with functional endoscopic sinus surgery or balloon sinoplasty. And if we are not successful, then we have to continue with turbinoplasty, but very, very rarely and very carefully, because again, we have to keep the functions of the nasal mucosa. What would I do if we have pediatric chronic rhinosomocytis more than 12 weeks? Uh, I'm doing allergy evaluation, immune workup, medical therapy improvement or no improvement, then immediately CT scan. Uh, if CT scan positive without anatomic abnormality, then what we have to do maxillary sinus lavage with uh, antibiotic and selective adenoidectomy or if we have anatomical abnormalities, then the first we start with adenoidectomy, then functional endoscopic sinus surgery, and we have to continue with medical management. In conclusion, pediatric chronic rhinosomocytis is multifactorial. Treatment is based on predisposing factors. Therapeutic options, prevalent treat etiology, reduce inflammatory response, and finally, you have to think surgery. I want to invite you for the next uh, meeting of the European Rhinologic Society. We changed the dates, in depends of situation and pandemic situation, from 8th to 11th of May 2021 in Thessaloniki, Greece. And next ERS Congress will be in Bulgaria in Sofia. That's why I want to invite you um, 2023 in Bulgaria during the ERS meeting. And now I want to show you a small video we did uh, last year for one Congress about our history of the Bulgarian Enologic Society. Enjoy the video. So, Deliana, I would love to um, thank you for the opportunity of having you talking about this uh, uh, this topic. While the video is going forward, I would uh, I would like to um, start by telling that uh, it's mandatory for everyone that uh, evidence-based medicine should be always look forward and. Uh, and what you, what you presented was uh, very up to date until now. So EPOS guidelines 2020 uh, were uh, actually presented today. However, for anyone interested, there are going to be uh, other you know, meetings online provided for from the ERS. So as you said, uh, this is important also to announce that the next meeting is has been changed from to this year to the next event. And then on the 2023, as you announced, it might be on, uh, uh, you will be, you know, the guest or the, the, the main one. So while this, this video is running out, I would uh, collect all the information and the questions. There's a few of them very interesting. Some of them has been already replied from you, however, and uh, we already have, uh, you already have gave those uh, uh, information to the people around uh, and from the audience. So uh, could you tell us where it's going to be? Do you have already set up or you have already an idea on where we should be on 2023? In Sofia, National Palace of Culture. Great, yeah. so for anyone interested- You, you don't know, I, I'm surprised that you don't know that. No, 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 no. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm trying <laughs> to tell the one that don't know, we have to tell them because sometimes oh, yeah. the people don't know and, and we all have, you know, you have to tell them where it's going to be 
from uh, do, do you and and we also have to announce a, a period of time so that people can organize themselves this is why i was uh, telling you this look you know? uh, we had a discussion with witzke valerie and claire these days and um, i didn't uh, choose uh, the dates because it's early to say not normally in june and probably will be in june we, we how weather we, yeah how is the wet weather on June? In June, I can say 35. Uh, it's hot. <laughs> no, uh, between 30 35. No more. August Wait. is a serious problem. Wait, so everyone re keep reminder, ERS meeting 2022. Uh, really thank you, very, thank you for your support because and your friendship because it's very important to people uh, now they prefer distance uh, communication and probably they have some fear for travels and the international travels that's why we have to back to the normal life but it will be difficult i don't know what will be happen because it's easy if we are doing webinars free of charge and no traveling, no costs uh, for anything. You know, the mentality of the people is difficult. Uh, yeah. Okay. I know. Uh, well, the, the advances of, of, the, of the online meeting is that you can reach everywhere simultaneously, providing education for everyone. So that's, that's the mandatory one. So thank you so much for the, for the last, uh, for the last uh, uh, video that you showed. So, it's about the time to go ahead for the for the question. So um, let's start with the question from the audience. The first question is coming from uh, Joseph, who is asking, would you suggest a cone beam methods instead of CT scan? No, I suggest it depends on the case, but uh, it's nice to do when it's necessary. That is my answer. Okay. Yeah, and don't forget that you have to not immediately to do CT scan. Many hospitals are doing immediately. It's not necessary. The first exam, everything, what you testing, uh, um, ENO control testing, some other measurements, then you have to continue with CT scan. CT scans is the the I can say uh, last uh, last step of the management. Because right. in children, you have to do a, a very uh, under the general anesthesia. And if we have no um, success uh, after the, I, I told you, 74 hours of antibiotic um, treatment. It's very interesting today on your topic. There's a lot of moms that are uh, following the presentation and they were actually asking simple questions and they were surprised about the adenoids uh, and stuff. So we also, you know, the, the funny, the, the good thing is that the association is reaching to the population and we, we provide information for, for family, family members. So, which is good. Another question from uh, from Joaquin, he asking, does azithromycin suggested in children under six years old? What? Under the six years old, what? Yes, it does azithromycin suggested in children under six years of age, I guess? Yes, yes. Yes, I suggest. And, uh, and, and uh, for how long? Uh, for how long? I can say for um, 10 days. Uh, but if, if uh, in depends of etiology factor and what kind of classification is this rhinosinusitis? Okay. Another question here from the Zoom application, Salome Cardozo is asking, what experience do you have with mycotic rhinosinusitis in pediatric patients with neutropenia? How do you treat them? Uh, it's a very difficult question. <laughs> uh, if we have neutrophilia, we have to find the reason, not only why we have neutrophilia. Probably this child has another one syndrome. And yeah. yes, that's why you have to check for the other syndrome. And then you have to treat correctly this child. 
I think that on, also there's something that you said is correct, which is uh, they might have something else. Uh, plus, uh, we can tell that mycotic in these patients, uh, if we are dealing with uh, um, some patients with mucormycosis, it's something, but it's uh, like a fungus bowl. Uh, treatment is not uh, medication, but is mandatory surgery. So we have to differentiate those patients, uh, and and. And the treatment, it varies depending on uh, other factors uh, like uh, previous diagnosis of others' health uh, problems. So in order to do it like this, this is fascinating. We will reach to this kind of this question. This is a very nice future. question because really it's very difficult for, to treat and uh, so many theories for this. But uh, the first of all, we have to check everything, uh, immunodeficiency here you have to check then to treat and to find the right the, the right drug for that and then you can we can think for surgery because you can do surgery but after that if uh, if the boss repeat again what we are doing nothing we have to to find the geological factor for that there's going to be however, yeah there's going to be however a panel on uh, fungus rhinocytes uh, in the next few months uh, so you if you want to get more information regarding this please uh, attend our meetings uh, another question that is coming from spain is uh, does not solutions changes biofilm they don't say who is the they, it's uh, they hide in the name of the of the attendees this is just the question okay it doesn't matter but biofilms it's a serious problem because uh we start to speak for biofilms it was 10 10 years ago but uh, believe me, not so many researchers are working for these biofilms. And where, where are localization of the biofilms? Uh, osteometal co complex is the first localization place. And uh, of, of course, uh, adenoids. And that's why it's much easy. Uh, if you are taking the nasal swab, you, you have to take from the adenoids, the, where is the epipharynx or nasal pharynx. And, but sometimes, you know, the microbiology is mixed and you cannot find the real, the biofilm um, research. That's why what we, if you are not any, uh, any one result, then what we are doing immediately, adenoidectomy, it's much easy. But um, biofilms are sitting, probably, if, we are, if they, they are in osteometal com complex, they're still there. And that's why we have to do what we have to do, nasal saline irrigation, it's much easier because uh, we don't have adenoids in the nasopharynx and um, we have to clear and to do lavash, lavash to remove these biofilms. But if you're uh, looking at the yeah. one slide, uh, they're not looking for the nasal swaps publications. They, they're looking for the sinus culture. They, uh, mm -hmm. What they're looking in the sinus culture is totally different mi microorganisms from nasal swap. All right. That's why the serious no, problem is uh, um, Staphylococcus aureus mm -hmm. in children. Another question from Mark Sunley. Do you suggest nasal irrigation with steroids and, and acetylcysteine or not? Not. I don't know who, who is doing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, believe me, because I'm reading so many <laughs> articles and uh, probably... Uh, have one but sometimes do you know some the people are very strange i mean the, our colleagues uh, during one my presentation uh one doctor asked me do you using probiotics in the nose and i was stressed because i never heard to use probiotics uh, um, guts in in the nose what is happening you have to use parallelly um I don't know how to use it, but whatever. Yes, it was <laughs> there's strange. A, um, there's a, do you use a nasal douches with spray or you suggest nasal douches with um, some administration of steroid inside of the nasal douches? No, na nasal douches in spray. It's very difficult for children to, to use another one. They're moving and you, you don't know what you're doing. The parents, uh, they have fear to, when they're doing. That's why it's much easier. Another question from, uh, from 
an Yaki uh, member and is, uh, would you suggest to use uh, antihistamines in patients suffering from recurrent asthmatic attack or antileukotriene? The last publications, uh, so they compare corticosteroids with antihistamines and the results was the same. One group with corticosteroids plus antihistamines and if you're using only corticosteroids, no difference. That's why I'm not suggesting for the liver to use both of them because they're children. And from the beginning, you know, the allergy, you, you have to treat them for a long period of time. And I, nobody not knows what will be happen later. That's why um, if you're using nasal corticosteroids, for example, or corticosteroids, don't use antihistamines together. All right, last question then, we are out of time. Uh, Salome is asking once again, when do you recommend such a resign? Antihistamine, yes. <laughs> Uh, a type of antihistamines. What I recommend, if uh, you ask me. When, when do you recommend, they asking? Ah, when you recommend it. At the beginning of inflammation. Do you know why? Because we have many histamines. When we're starting the inflammation from virus, for example, we have in the blood so many histamines. That's why immediately if you, if you put antihistamine, you will block the inflammation. It's not necessary to give antibiotic. That's why for common cold and some for allergic rhinitis, it depends of the type of rhinitis, you can use antihistamines I'm using. Great. But in some difficult cases, um, I suggest to use not third generation antihistamines. I'm using, uh, I'm sometimes in uh, some difficult case, I'm using second generation because second generation is blocked more H1 blockers. Uh, H1 receptors, sorry. Okay, okay so uh, due to the fact that we, we're going to be a little bit out of time, I would like to congratulate Diliana for the participation and uh, really glad that you pointed out this topic because it was uh, never been expressed before. So it, we had the, the whole update on 2020. Uh, before closing the remarks, please do remind that the next appointment, uh, I would love to, um, to tell, invite anyone for tomorrow's meeting. We are going to have uh, one of my friends, Hossam al-Sharif uh, from uh, Egypt, who is going to talk about orbital complication of sinusitis and also also uh, tomorrow from the frontal ERS webinar meetings uh, the agenda is going to be pretty pretty good so if anyone is interested please do, re do remember that this appointment uh, is fixed for tomorrow as you can see here at uh, 20 CET which means uh, 9 p.m. UK time we have uh, a bunch of uh, colleagues uh, uh, talking about different uh, topics, managing the frontal sinus uh, from Anshusama, how can I operate safely endonasally from Chemeco, and then Ioannis Kostantinidis, who's uh, been previously our guest and actual president of the ERS. Is there a place for returning to external approaches? That's a good question, also because we are dealing by now with this COVID-19 pandemic, and, the, and the, the thing is that we have to reconsider, or do we have to reconsider our strategies? We will see tomorrow. Thank you, Diliana, for participating. Thank you, for being... Thank you. Many Thank greetings you. to all Italian friends, and I'm waiting you, you in Bulgaria. Thank you so much. So appointment fixed 2022. Don't forget, Sofia. Thank you so 2023. much. 2023. <laughs> 2023. We changed the why... year. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So be careful that you have to change the video because the last slides were Bulgarian 2022. Don't yes, forget. Yes, but to it, it was. I told you at the beginning that it's an old video. Oh, no, I know. I know. So if anyone wants to know more. There's a Facebook page from the Bulgarian Rhinologic Society. You can go there and get all the information needed. It's just Bulgarian Rhinologic Society. For those who's interested, we tagged on our Facebook page the Bulgarian Rhinologic Society. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. I'm appreciate. Thank you. Hey, thank Have you a so nice much. day Goodbye. and evening.